Oh man, it's so good to be here, see what the Lord is doing. Uh, God bless you guys, and thank, thank you to Pastor Gerald, Pastor BJ, the staff here. Can we just bless them, give them a round of applause for all the servanthood behind the scenes. And what an amazing uh, topic to be looking to right now at a, a juncture like this in the history of the church and in the history of the world. If you have your Bibles, open with me to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6, we are going to, I'm going to say this by faith, we're going we're, we're gonna to attack this whole chapter. I believe the Lord has so much in store for us. As you're turning there, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the Lord's blessing upon his word um, and just ask him to open our hearts now and give us insight. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your spirit. We thank you for the power that is made available uh, to us in you, Lord. But not only that, Lord, we thank you for the relationship you've given us with your spirit. And we pray that you be our teacher. Lord, we pray that you would give us understanding. We pray that as we navigate through this text, Lord, that you would minimize all distraction and anything that would hinder us from receiving what it is you have in store for us. Lord, we pray that it be removed and that you'd speak to us in power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. If you're taking notes during this session, the title of this message is Waging War God's Way. Uh, waging war God's way. It's been so uh, accurately stated throughout many, many of the studies uh, this morning, this afternoon, that this walk as believers is a warfare. There's a danger in minimizing that. Uh, make no mistake about it. We, we have been called to this warfare. We've been called, and, and I want to emphasize that point. You have been called to it. Because in light of that, you've also been called to live a life of victory. And that's what we're going to see in this chapter today. Uh, warfare is not something that should surprise us. Warfare is not something that uh, should discourage us. In fact, the, the Bible tells us that we should not be ignorant of Satan's devices. That we should uh, stand firm against the wiles of the devil. And understand that he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But when you approach the book of Joshua, you must understand that it's not just a record of military victories of Joshua and his army in the land of Canaan. As was mentioned previously today, that the history of the nation of Israel is typical history. Egypt is a type of the world and the bondage that we face in it. As the Israelites were led out of their slavery in Egypt, so we are delivered out of the kingdom of Satan and into the kingdom of God. The Lord has delivered us out of this world and in, out of bondage, but he's also delivered us into the kingdom of God. We've been delivered out of for the purpose of being brought into something. The crossing of the Jordan is a type of our baptism and our union with Jesus Christ. And the land of Canaan is the promised land. It's a place of spiritual rest. It's a place of spiritual rest. But how can this be? How can the land of Canaan be both a place of spiritual rest, but also a place of spiritual warfare? I believe this chapter chronicles that so well. We need to understand this truth as we approach this chapter. Why? Because Canaan was always God's desire. If you read the promise of God to Abraham in Genesis chapter 14, this was always God's plan. It was always God's plan to bring them into the promised land of Canaan. You remember the promise of God to Abraham? That his, his descendants would multiply and inherit this land? And at that time and up until this point, even up until this very moment in the life of Joshua, for generations and generations, it seemed like nothing but an impossibility. And that's so typical of the promises of God. He'll give us a promise, but our eyes will always be overwhelmed with the reality of the impossibility of the fulfillment of that promise. Canaan was always the goal for God's people. The promised land was always the goal for God's people. A place of spiritual rest and complete victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's God's will for your life and mine. Complete rest in him. 
complete victory in him. In the book of Hebrews, the author tells us, Paul tells us, that we are to be diligent to enter into this rest. In our text and throughout the book of Joshua, we discover, again, that Canaan is also a place of warfare. This interesting dichotomy that this place of rest that you and I are in, this promised land that the Lord has called us to live in, to this abundant life that he's called us into, we are so well aware of the reality of the presence of warfare. Sometimes in our life, the presence of Satan is more tangible than the presence of Jesus. So often we're so aware of the reality of opposition and difficulty and spiritual warfare that the presence of, of the Prince of Peace ruling and guarding in our hearts and our minds is so drowned out and that should not be. When you go into the promised land, this land of victory, this place of spiritual rest that the Lord desires for all of us, we will wrestle. We will contend with an enemy, right? Ephesians 6.12 tells us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. 2 Corinthians 10 tells us that we walk in the flesh, we don't War according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're spiritual, they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Why is this and how can this be? We've heard a lot about God's plan for your life today, and that is true. And we're going to dive into the depths of that truth today as we see the plan of God unfold in the life of Joshua. But Satan also has a plan for your life as well, and it's to destroy you. And he'll never be content until you are absolutely consumed. But be encouraged. Because the presence of warfare should also reassure us of the reality of victory. Because without warfare, there is no possibility of victory. And our text in Joshua chapter 6 shows us how we're to obtain this victory. Put, put, Put before us in our text this afternoon is Israel's first battle in the promised land. As soon as they come out of the wilderness into Canaan, they're confronted with Jericho. And we're all confronted with Jerichos in our life, at different seasons in our our life. I love what Alan Redpath said in his book, uh, his commentary on the book of Joshua and Victorious Christian Living. I quote, he says, to some Jericho may be a force from within their own personality, some weakness of temperament, or weakness of character. Most of us know that there's a weak spot in our makeup. Maybe it's something we learned as children, which has followed us and often conquered us through our adolescence and youth and into mature years. Each one knows well enough that there's a place where he has to set a spiritual guard, for there is a Jericho. It may be that Jericho in your life is something outside of yourself, Perhaps an impossible situation in your family circle and in your home life? Is there something that seems to keep you right back from doing what God, what you honestly believe is the will of God? Time and time again, God has spoken to you, maybe about serving Him on the mission field or in some special sphere of opportunity. And yet, always between you and the will of God, there is a Jericho. It stands there week by week and it baffles and mocks you. For you are conscious all the time that it is holding you back from being the man or the woman that God has called you to be. These impossibilities, these Jerichos in our life are not put before us to destroy us, but so that you and I may know and experience the power of God. Write that down. This must be Uh, so sealed in your mind as we go through this text today that the impossibilities and sometimes the impossible things that the Lord asks of you are not put before you to destroy you but so that you may know God in a deeper measure and experience his power and truth. Let's look at verse one together. The point that I want to unfold, the first point that I want to unfold in 
verse 1 is that if we're going to wage this warfare effectively and fully enter into all that God has for us, we must understand that the task will always seem impossible. Just get used to that in your ministry. It has to be impossible or else it's not always God. So if the Lord is showing you something to do for him, the Lord has given you a promise, he's given you a command, if it seems impossible, be encouraged. Look at verse one, it says, now Jericho was securely shut up because all the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. God put the impossibility of the task before Joshua. Look at the text, look at verse one. It says Jericho was securely shut up. We can't understand this, we can't underestimate the significance of this statement. Remember the report of the 10, of the 12 spies that Moses sent out to spy out the land of Canaan? Deuteronomy 1 in verse 28 says this, they came back and they said, where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts saying, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we, can, we have seen the sons of Anakin there. This was not just some uh, thing that the Lord was putting before him. These walls that Jericho had were huge and they were securely shut up. Moreover, the people behind the walls were more fit for battle than they were. They were larger in number. They were larger in, staff, or in stature. They were more uh, militarily equipped than they were. They had a stronghold and Israel did not. And the previous generation was afraid. But the Lord had given them this land already before it was already obtained. But it was an impossible task. That's always the way it is. If we're going to wage this warfare effectively, fully enter into all that God has for us, we need to understand that the task will always seem, seem impossible. But secondly, we also must believe that God has already gone before us. If you have your Bibles, I wanna kind of journey a little bit through the book of Joshua. Look at Joshua chapter two with me quickly. I wanna fully illustrate to you that before the battle has already begun, that God had already gone before his people in a very dramatic measure. Joshua two, verses eight through 11. It says this, now before they lay down, she, that is Rahab, came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for, ye, for, we, for you when we came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, who, utterly who you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is a God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Look down a few verses to verses 23 and 24. It says, so the two men returned descended from the mountain and crossed over. And they came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had befallen them. And they said to Joshua, truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands, for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. Look quickly with me at chapter five and verse one. It says, so it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. God did not show Joshua the impossibility of the task without first proving his faithfulness to him. God has always gone before his people and God will always go before his people and that's what the Lord is teaching Joshua. Joshua, I've already gone before you. I've already worked in the hearts of these people. They're already faint-hearted. They're already defeated. 
The battle is already yours. You've already won. All you need to do is go in and possess what I have already given to you, but I want you, Joshua, I want you to possess it in the way in which I've asked you to possess it. He was faithful. He's gone before him, but he was also faithful to assure his presence to him. You remember the the preceding verses in Joshua 5, verses 13 through 14. It says, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, no, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said, what does my Lord have to say to his servants. This was not Joshua's battle. This was the Lord's battle. And the Lord had already gone before Joshua. And the Lord on multiple occasions had already promised Joshua, his presence to Joshua. Joshua was a man of war. You remember in Exodus chapter 17, he had, he had multiple military victories. But in the promised land, these victories were going to come through a different manner. Joshua's role was to walk by faith in the promises of God, trust God's plan, and obey his commands. Let's make warfare really simple. Let's make uh, doing what God has called you and I to do very simple. Your role and my role is to walk by faith in God's promises, to trust God's plan, and obey his commands. Look at verse two. It says, and the Lord said to Joshua, see. This word see is an interesting word. It means look, it means inspect, perceive, consider. The Lord is drawing his eyes to the impossibility of the task. He's like, Joshua, I want you to look at these walls. See, I have, because I've given them to you, Joshua. I've given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. Notice the tense in which the Lord spoke to Joshua. He didn't speak to him in past tense. He didn't speak to him in future tense. He spoke to him in present tense. The victory was already his. The victory, whatever your Jericho is here today, the victory is already yours. It's non negotiable. It is what it is. It's a truth. This land, this promised land, this life of faith that the Lord has called us into is a life of victory. The sad thing is, is that we so often settle for less than what all God has called us for. The victory was his. Remember prior to crossing the Jordan, God promised him in Joshua 1, 3 through 5, Every place where the sole of your foot touches, I have given you. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But I want you to note this truth, that before every battle that Joshua faced, the promise of God came. You and I, when we are faced with a difficulty in ministry, when we're faced with a difficult task in our lives, when the impossibility is put before us, We should expect the promise and do not move until God speaks. Do not move until the promise comes, the reassurance of his presence. The battle of Jericho, this verse that we're considering now, he says, see Joshua, I have given you Jericho, his king and the mighty men of valor. The battle of Ai and Joshua 8, 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. The battle of Gibeon, Joshua 10, 8. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. When did Joshua fail in battle? In the next chapter, because he got self-confident. He didn't sit and wait and receive the promise from the Lord, the direction from the Lord before he went to battle and he failed. Why? There was sin in the camp. Joshua learned the lesson. Wait for the promise. Wait for the direction. Because God promises his presence, he promises victory and he promises he has already gone before you. God promised victory before victory was experienced. If we're going to wage war God's way, 
we must walk by faith in the promises of God. If you haven't understood this truth yet, this life that the Lord has called us to, it's a life of faith. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we walk, 17, that we walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 that we please God through faith. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. Jesus said in Luke 18, when the son of man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? A faith that waits, a faith that perseveres, a faith that is persistent in prayer, a faith that is willing to take him at his word. But we also must trust his plan. And this is where I believe many of us get tripped up. If we're going to experience victory in the battles that the Lord has called us to, if we're going to wage war God's way, we need to trust his plan. I, I, I can tell you, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, to trust in the Lord with all your heart, to lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. I went through a season of my life where the Lord it shows me clear as day what he's doing in my life and what he wanted to do in my life. And I did nothing but doubt it because all I see is impossibilities before me. And the Lord showed me that I was praying wrong. And what he showed me in the midst of that season is that I don't trust him. He said, wait, you, <laughs> you teach others how to trust me, but you don't trust me. And so my prayer life changed. Lord, teach me how to trust in you, Lord. I realize I don't, I don't possess the truth as my own in Proverbs 3, 5. I'm so prone to lean on my own understanding, Lord. But help me to acknowledge you in all my ways. Trusting that you're directing my path. Even though I can't see it, I don't understand what you're doing. Solidify this in your heart. If you're going to experience victory, if you want to stop wrestling today with the Lord... Just trust what he's shown you. And if you don't trust him, be willing and bold enough in your prayer life to confess to him what he already knows, that you don't trust him. And that he's willing to help you. But once his plan to you is revealed, once his directions to you are made clear, you must trust his plan. Look at verses 3 through 5. It says, The Lord told him, you shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do for six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. But on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow their trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with a ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the walls of the city, notice this, they will fall down. And the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Notice what's taking place, what the Lord is telling Joshua in the reality, the overwhelming truth of this commandment is that none of it makes sense. Ever been there? Are you living there right now? That none of it makes sense? In fact, I love what Pastor Jason just pointed out is that the Lord weakened his people before they went to this, the, the, the reality of the difficulty of this battle. And the Lord does that to us. Why? To produce dependency. To produce an absolute dependence upon him. That's the only way he will work. He will not share his glory with man. None of this made sense to the natural mind. God's plan never makes sense. God's plan in Abraham's life didn't make sense. Go to a land that I will show you. Remember in Genesis 22, I want you to take Isaac, your only son, the evidence of my, the fulfillment of my plan in your life, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Joseph was given a dream multiple dreams of what God was going to do in his life and then he is sold into slavery by his brothers. He's falsely accused and thrown into prison. Moses knew what God was going to do in his life. But then he's in the wilderness for 40 years and the Lord tells him to go back and the plan really didn't make that much sense. Before the Red Sea, the Lord tells him to hold up your staff 
and the reality of the impossibility, and the Lord tells him to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In David's life, he was the last of all of his brothers. In Gideon, God stripped him of 32,000 soldiers down to 300. In Naaman's life, he told him to dip in the river seven times. God's plan didn't make sense in any of these men's life. Why would God's plan make sense in your life and mine? Stop trying to figure it out and just rest and trust in his plan. Why does God work this way? To produce humility in you and I. Humility is attractive to God. He desires to produce humility. He puts us in a place where you and I must submit to the infinity of his wisdom. We must acknowledge that our resources have no power. He works this way because he wants to produce humility, but he also wants to produce a confidence in him. God desires to magnify his own power that he might be exalted in his own strength, not the strength of his instruments. Not the strength of you and I. God works in this way to try the faith, the obedience, and patience of the people. To try whether they would observe the, a precept which to human policy seemed foolish to obey and believe. A promise which in human probability seemed impossible to be performed. But rest assured in this truth. Is that your obedience, it pleases the heart of God. I... I I, I've heard Elizabeth Elliot, my wife is always listening to Elizabeth Elliot. It's, she's on the, in the house all the time. <laughs> she's the, the background voice in our house when she's doing the dishes all the time. And there's so many times that I hear, and the Lord uses it to speak to me, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Christ than to trust and obey. Your obedience, your trust, it pleases the heart of God. God desires to see your trust displayed in obedience. It's not enough to just say you trust him. He wants you to obey him. Your obedience to the revealed will of God, even when it doesn't make any sense, is your greatest display of your trust in God. Obedience moves the heart of God. And it secures the promise of God. And understand this truth. There's no power in my life or yours apart from obedience. God desired obedience in the life of Joshua. Through the rest of the chapter, we will see the children of Israel secure the victory over Jericho as they walk by faith and they display their trust in God through their unwavering obedience. Through the rest of this chapter, we'll see many tests to their obedience. And I want you to, what I, what I want to put before you is how they pass this test when their obedience was tested. Will their trust in God displayed through their obedience be on display? Let's look at verses six through nine. It says, then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The, the armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets and the rear, the rear guard came after the ark while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. This was an amazing scene. Earlier in the book of Joshua, it says that there was 40,000 armed men prepared for war. This is quite the scene. The priest went out to the battle. Notice, in this chapter, the ark of God is mentioned 11 times. The ark represents the presence of God. And as they would walk around this, the wall, one day, two days, 
three days, day in and day out, the plan in their hearts and in their minds still not making any sense, not seeing any movement, not seeing God work. Every day their faith was tested. Every day their trust was tested. Every day their obedience was tested. They were assured of God's presence amongst them. But the priests also went out with them. And the priests had a unique role in the battles of Israel. It was appointed that when they went to war, the priests should encourage them with the assurance of God's presence with them. If you take notes in the margins of your Bible, this would be a good place to to jot down Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 2 through 4. As Moses gives them the principles of warfare, it says, So it shall be, when you are on the verge of battle, that the priests shall approach and speak to the people. And he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid. And do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you and against your enemies to save you. It was the role of the priests to encourage the people before battle. The blowing of their trumpets was to be a sign to the people that they should be remembered before the Lord their God in the day of battle. Numbers 10 verse 9 says this, When you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered before the Lord your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. Usually, This was the role of the priests, to encourage the people, to sound the trumpet, to be remembered before the Lord. But typically, the priests were excluded from battle. But at this battle, the Lord called the priests to go with them. Why? Because the priests, they were God's ministers. Remember, upon their chests were the 12 stones with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, ascribed on them. They represented the tribes of Israel in their battles. Remember that the priests were arrayed with linen garments so as to not sweat in their service unto the Lord. In other words, no sweat would need to be produced in this battle. Upon their foreheads was inscribed holiness to the Lord. This battle would be consecrated and holy to the Lord. The priests went to battle because this was primarily a spiritual battle. This was an act of worship. This was a work of God. This was something that God was doing. This is what the Lord was seeking to display to his people. I fight your battles in this land. You trust and you obey. And you watch me work. As a Christian, we have the assurance of God's presence with us and in us and upon us. And you and I, we have a better high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who goes before us in every single battle. Amen? Look at verse 10 with me. It says, Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout nor make any noise. Probably the hardest part of this whole battle. Just don't speak. I don't know about you, but when I'm going through a warfare, I'm sp- <laughs> I talk too much. And we can all be guilty of that. You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. All of the, com- the people were commanded not to speak or make any noise. Take this point down. We must work to maintain a quiet obedience. As we trust God's plan, as we simply obey what he's called us to do, don't allow your own insecurities or your own inability to understand what God has called you to do to talk too much. Just be still in his presence. The Bible says that God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. Let him speak. Let him calm your heart. Maintain a quiet obedience. Many many times quiet obedience is our greatest challenge. 
We must be diligent to maintain a quiet heart before God as we wait obediently upon him. Elizabeth Elliot in one of her books wrote this, Lord, this is a prayer of her heart. Lord, give to me a quiet heart that does not ask to understand, but confident steps forward in darkness guided by thy word. Lord, give me a quiet heart that does not ask to understand, but confident steps forward in darkness guided by thy word. Lord, give us a quiet heart as we obey you, even though we don't understand what it is that you're doing. Verse 11, it says, So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns, before the ark of the Lord, went on continually and blew the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once, and returned to the camp. Notice this. So they did this six days. They were to do this once a day, for six days. Imagine what that, that probably felt like. W walk around one time and come back. Imagine what the chatter in the camp could have been. And I'll just encourage you people who are assistants here today. You're serving under in a ministry and you don't understand what God's doing or what the Lord has called your pastor to do. Your role is not to produce chatter amongst your comrades of how much you could do it better or how much you don't understand. If you needed to know, God would show you. But they didn't need to know. They needed to obey. And the quietness in the camp is what produced, it, what produced unity in the camp. It was just their willingness to obey, to go back and sit and wait quietly upon the Lord, when they had every reason to be concerned, when they had every, every day they walked around these walls, and every day the reality of the impossibility of this task, every day for six days, this promise was tested. God could have caused the walls of Jericho to fall upon the first, at the first sounding of them easily. God asked them to go around them for 13 times before they fell. God had them linger many days about Jericho, seeming to do nothing nor make any progress. You ever been there? <laughs> You're just doing what God asks you to do. You're just plowing in the same ground, seemingly making no progress. Just keep plowing. I believe that's a word from the Lord for someone here today. Just keep plowing. In God's time and God's way, he will move. God doesn't only desire a quiet obedience. God desires a patient obedience. God desires a patient obedience. It's difficult to be quiet. It's difficult to be patient. But to secure a patient obedience, we must live a life surrendered to and filled by the Holy Spirit because true patience is only produced by the power of the Holy Spirit and a life that is yielded to him. You remember the life of Job? You remember the commentary of the life of Job in James chapter five about his patience, that Job patiently waited upon the Lord only to see that the end intended was better than the beginning? God will be a debtor to no man. We need to work out patience in our life. Why? Because it's pleasing to God. Jesus said, by your patience possesses your souls. Deliverance must be ex expected in God's way and in God's time. You and I need to wait patiently. We need to obey patiently. And we need to obey quietly. Let's pick up the pace here. In verse 15 it says... But it came to pass on the seventh day that, though, that they arose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day, only they marched around the city seven times. Verse 16, it says, In the seventh time it happened, 
when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that, were, that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the, here's more commandments, and you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take the accursed things. And make the camp of Israel curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Why? Why did the Lord want these things? Not because he needed them. God didn't need them. But their obedience to this was pleasing to him. Jericho was the first fruits of the land of Canaan. All the valuables were to be entirely devoted to God. God wants this in your life and mine too. He wants the first fruits to be entirely devoted to him. Not because he needs them, but because it brings pleasure to him. That you and I would sacrifice to him, would give to him the first fruits of our day, the first fruits of our labor, the first fruits of our faith, all of it. Give it unto him. Verse 20 says, And the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Victory. No doubt, at the fall of the wall, many inside the city were killed. The Lord accomplish victory that in which they trusted in these walled cities these huge cities that in which they trusted to be their defense proved to be their destruction I love when the Lord does that he takes what is appeared to be the strength of the enemy and makes it the source of his defeat he's able to do that we can look at this world and we can be so enamored by what the enemy is doing that's why I was so encouraged last night. I'm so encouraged today because we're constantly inundated with the agenda of the enemy in this world. We're constantly discouraged about how bad America is and, and it is and it's awful. But I'm also encouraged that God has called me, that he's called you for such a time as this. What a privilege, what an honor to serve him and to carry the light of the gospel into the darkest generation in the history of this world. And I want you to be encouraged. Because I saw 46 people, young people, raised up to serve the Lord. We heard about what's going on in Mexico. And I just encourage you, the Lord is moving in power through this world. He will build his church. Remember this. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You and I can be so enamored by what's going on in this world, or we can be so encouraged about the reality of God in our life, begin to take steps of faith, and expect the walls of Jericho to fall down again and again and again and again because he's for us and he's not against us. And he wants to use you to do it. But he desires you to trust him. He desires you to obey him. And these things that are the enemy's devices, the Lord will use to destroy his own plot. He does it time and time again. The shout that they shouted of the trumpets, it wasn't that that made the walls of Jericho fall down. It was their faith in the promise of God and it was the trust in his plan. It's not the loud noises in your life. It's not the amazing things that we want God to do that's going to make the Jerichos fall down in our life. For me, it's, for me, it's easy to take steps of faith at times that seem crazy to others. My faith is tested when the Lord tells me to sit still and be quiet. But that's when he moves most powerfully in my life. That's when the walls of Jericho fall in my life. When I begin to walk by faith in his promises, when I begin to simply trust in his, his plan, it was their faith that made the walls of Jericho fall down. Hebrews 11.30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down flat, and afterwards they, after they encircled the city for seven days. 
Well, let's close this up. Let's look at verse 21. It says, And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep, and donkey with the edge of the sword. Why? Why did God command utter destruction of the city and everything in it? It was because of the spiritual darkness that was practiced there. Deuteronomy 18. I don't want to just gloss over this verse because it's important. It says, When you come into the land... Verses 9 through 14, when you come into the land that the Lord is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or anyone who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for these nations which you will dispossess. Listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Why did they have to rid the, 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 the land of Jericho of everything? It's because of the demonic strongholds there. The demonic worship, the idol worship. You and I can't accept in or walk in the power that is in this world that we're trying to conquer for Jesus. We can't. We can't adopt these things into our life. There must be no leaven amongst God's people. There's no power in the things of this world. Verse 22 and 23 says this, But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has, and as you swore to her. And the young men who had had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp. Notice the Bible says, Hebrews 11.31, By faith... By the harlot Rahab did not perish. Verse 24 says this. But they burned the city. Notice, complete obedience. They burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in the land of Israel to this day. Because she hid the messengers of Joshua to spy, out the, to spy out Jericho. Then Joshua charged them at that time saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city, Jericho. He shall lie its foundation with its firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame sp- spread throughout all the country. Why? Joshua was not made great because he was great, because the presence of God was with him. In Joshua, God found a man who, despite all the impossibilities of the task, in spite his inability to understand the plan of God, was willing to walk by faith in God's promises to him and to trust his plan and to obey his commandments. And I close with that truth. That's all God wants from you here today. Walk by faith in his promises. Allow your trust in him to be displayed by your obedience. That's all God is looking for for in you. You may be here today asking, Lord, what is it that you want for my life? You may be in a season, it may not even be ministry related, it might be family related. You're suffering, you're struggling. Wayward child, one you prayed for. And you're, you're, you're weary and you're waiting. Your discouragement has produced disobedience. You stop believing the promise of God. If that's you here today, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you to come up to the front. I just want to pray for you. Before you leave out the door this this week. The Lord has spoken so much to our hearts. If the Lord has given you a promise and he's shown you the impossibility of the task 
and you're struggling with believing and trusting that plan and your, your obedience to that is, is inconsistent and you just want to be able to trust him and you want to be able to obey him but in your flesh you're weak. Just come up and I'm gonna stand with you and we're gonna pray and we're gonna ask the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us and to enable us to walk by faith. Anybody at all? Awesome. This is nothing at all to be ashamed of. <laughs> we waver in our faith. The Lord desires us to trust him. Father, I pray for those up here this afternoon, Lord. Lord, I don't know, but you know. You know all things. You even know the why. <laughs> you know the thing that we desperately want to know, that you have chosen to withhold from our understanding, Lord. Lord, I pray from this point on that you would just take us in, in a wonderful journey of trusting you. Lord, and as we learn how to trust you, Lord, I pray that the promise that we're waiting for, the fulfillment of it would, would almost be secondary, Lord, because there is a deep intimacy with you taking place. Lord, I pray that you would do that for them, Lord. Lord, and I ask that you would baptize us with the power of your spirit, Lord, and give us the power we need to obey your commandments, Lord. Help us to be quick to hear and slow to speak. Help us to be patient, Lord, we admit that we're but dust and we're nothing and we need you, Lord. So I pray and I ask, we ask together, Lord, that you would just help us, Lord. That you would help us, Lord. Lord, that you would have mercy on us. And that you'd equip us to walk by faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. God bless you guys.